Awesome. Tonight we're welcoming a powerhouse speaker and prophetic voice. She's the executive pastor at Jesus Culture in Sacramento, and we know that she has an incredible word for us tonight. Would you guys please stand to your feet and give a warm welcome to Becky Johnson. Texas really does everything better, don't you? Don't you? Even greeting. You guys can be seated. Please be seated. I'm so honored and excited to be here. Um, thank you so much to just Pastor Dawn and the team for having me. They've hosted us so well. Me and my lovely assistant, Jamie. She's 24. She's single. She really hates. I'm shocked she hasn't quit because I do that every time we go somewhere. It never works for her because she's still single, so I'm not helping. <laughs> I love you. Um, so just so honored to be here. What a house. I have had the privilege of just hearing some of the God stories that have built this place and that have led you all here. And uh, my own faith is stirred to believe for what God wants to do in his church. And you guys are a part of a wonderful house that's believing for really great things. So thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. We really honor you and bless you as um, it's just so incredible. I feel like I'm just walking into legacy. That's what it feels like. I'm just walking into legacy, getting a picture of uh, what God wants to do through family. And so you guys are awesome and in really good hands. And I just, I'm excited to just be here closing it out. Can we just have some fun? Um, well, I would, I would love to um, give some prophetic words if that's okay. I, I, um, I don't, I don't do it every time, but when the when the leaders say it's okay, I, I love to minister in the prophetic, and I, I love just asking God what's on his heart, and uh, there's people, God wants to speak to every single one of you, but sometimes, right, some are, are highlighted differently for whatever reason that God knows, and so um, I like to do that, so I just have a couple of words for some of you. Uh, is this being recorded? Are we good? They'll get the recording after, because sometimes we'll say get your voice memo ready for your phone, but if it's getting recorded, then you can get the recording uh, from John, right? Yeah, okay, great. He'll get it for you. He'll get it for you. He can do anything with those arms. I'm like, I feel, he's like, do you need anything? I'm like, no, but if I did, I know you could do it. Someone have a jar of pickles that need to be opened? What? <laughs> um, so I'll uh, just dis describe you, ask you to stand up, and then I do just ask you to close your eyes. That's not more spiritual, and I can hear God if your eyes are open. It's just awkward for me when you're staring at me <laughs> like this, and I'm trying to prophesy. So that's the only reason I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. But I just have a, a word here for Corey and Bree. Yeah, you guys are so amazing. And that baby, give it up for the baby. Callan, Callan. I was trying to not make eye contact with her during worship because if I make eye contact, moms, you know how it is. I want to hold the baby. I'm like, I've got to stay focused right now. I cannot hold that baby. i got to stay focused. But afterwards, if he's still here, I want to hold him. Awesome. Why don't you guys just close your eyes and it's getting recorded. Um, just a, a real simple word that I, I heard over you guys is I heard, um, I heard him say, I'm establishing them. And I saw him just, uh, that the, the word establishment is over you. And that there is, uh, you're in a season of foundational building, um, not you guys as believers, the foundation's there, you're wise and wonderful and mature, but there is something that the Lord is doing with your family and with the two of you, and this is a season of foundations, and specifically for you, sister, I just felt like you needed to hear that, that the season you're in, you're, it is a foundation lane, it is a brick lane season, and don't worry about the height of the wall, don't worry about the width, the depth, don't even worry so much about the blueprint, God's got all of that under control, sis, he wants you to know that he is laying a foundation with with you because what you are called to carry and the mantle that is on your life is going to require a significant foundation. And these years right now, uh, these moments, they're not wasted. You're not, uh, you, it's not unseen. It's not without purpose. It might feel like that. What, uh, it might feel like, man, when, when is it really going to kick up? When am I really going to start walking into my destiny? When am I really going to fulfill the calling that God has for me? And the Lord is like, you are in the calling. We are preparing. We are laying the foundation for what you cannot even think 
see or imagine right now the, the heights that he has for you. And I just saw a significant a foundation being laid for you and, and bricks being laid. And man, foundations are never, the, people aren't like driving to construction sites to watch the foundation being poured. That's like the most boring part, but we know that it's the most important part. And that's what season that you're in right now. And so take it all in. I just, I, I, I felt like the Lord just like wanted to come and say like, stop. Stop worrying about where we're going and let's be where we are because I'm in this with you and this is significant and this is important and you will look back on this season and you'll say, oh, I, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am if I didn't have those foundation years and there's just great pleasure in that and great joy in that and there's so much to be had in that. So I felt that for you and for you, Corey, um, I, I don't, I'll just say this and we see in part, prophesy in part, and you test it and take it for what it's worth. But I just saw you in a bit of a wrestle, and maybe even in your heart of hearts, just asking the Lord some pretty significant questions. Um, and I just heard the Lord say, keep asking. Um, he wants you to lean into those questions. Uh, I saw that the questions are good. The questions are healthy. The questions are actually what's going to give you your philosophy and strategy for leadership. And that there is something really unique about how you lead. You have a really different wiring even than, than your dad. And, <laughs> and um, that, that's okay. And I don't know if this is maybe just a moment for the Lord to say, hey, I like how you think because I made how you think. I like how you lead because I made how you lead. Um, and that these questions that you're asking, uh, just know that the, you trust yourself. You love the Lord. Your heart is in alignment. You are humble. I, I just saw humility on you guys, um, the, the submission on you guys. Like, that's not in question. Your heart's not in question. And just because you're wrestling with God and asking some questions that maybe nobody else is asking, it's because you, you have a creative wiring and a, and a really different, unique mind and gift set. And so those questions aren't to uh, be subversive. Those questions aren't to be dishonoring. And I just saw the Lord say, like, I'm inviting you into that. And, and there is something about the questions that you ask as a leader that's going to open up a strategy of heaven because it is so different how you think, so creative, so kingdom-minded. And so I just bless that in you. So we just stretch our hands towards them, church, and we just say we bless you, Corey and Bree. We bless the leaders that you are. We bless the mom and dad that you are. We bless the season that you're in. And I just sense, uh, man, for you guys to know, they are with you. They are with you. And you guys, just God's got you right in his pocket. And it's a beautiful season. Enjoy it. Embrace it. We bless you guys. And we just say yes and amen to what God's doing in you. Amen. You right here. Yep. Right here. Yeah. Awesome. What's your name? Chantel. Incredible. Chantel, could you just close your eyes? Are you, you're not on staff here, are you? Are you just, you're just attending? You're not even from here? Oh, amazing. This is probably weird for you. <laughs> Chantel, I looked over at you and just saw someone who's been through the fire. And I heard the Lord say, she's been with me through the testing. She's been with me through the trial. You've endured. You've endured. And there is a strength inside of you that only comes from enduring the fire. There is a resolve. Your, I'll be preaching about this tonight, but your resolve has been tested. And you've been through more than people would know. Like, it's like, yeah, you're gorgeous. You look like you got it all together. You do your makeup great. You've got great style. Like, you... But inside, it's like people don't know what you've faced. The people don't know what you've had to go through, what you've had to walk through, and what you've had to endure. And I just saw the Lord come in in a moment of recognition and saying, I know and I see I've been with you and I will be with you. And it's not, and nothing is wasted in your life, Chantel. Nothing is wasted. It has all been for the unfolding of his plans and purposes in your life. And what you have walked through and what you have picked up from those life experiences, he is going to use it. 
He is going to. There are parts, I just even sense that there's parts of your experiences and your journey that you're like, I just wish I could forget that. Um, let's just erase that from the timeline. And how about we put a little bit of white out on that because that was, you know, not something that I want to remember. And the Lord's like, we are going to embrace your story because it's what makes you you. I'm in every detail of your life. His hand has been on you since you were a little girl. There's actually, that he's rescued you from several things that, that maybe should have gone a different way, but because the hand of God on your life, because of what you're called to do, and I actually saw your life speaking to so many other young women's lives through a, a study or discipleship of young girls, but there is something, God, God is, you're still in process. God's still forming your resolve. You're still becoming sure of yourself and stepping into what he has for you, but there, your your life story, every single part of it, God wants to redeem, turn around, and, and put his stamp of approval on because all of it is what makes you you. And there's not a part that he's ashamed of. There's not a part that he wants to blot out. If there were, if there were parts of your timeline that got cut out, it wouldn't be Chantel. And there's something about you owning that and embracing that. And there has been even voices that have thrown shame on you and tried to label you certain things and tried to dis discourage you or uh, disqualify you. But let me just tell you who God calls, he qualifies. Not man, it's God. And that's what he's been in your life and that's what he's doing. And so... We just want to bless that. You are a powerful, mighty woman of God. And so everyone's just going to stretch their hands towards you. And can we just say this word, church, just to declare this over Chantel? Can we say redemption? redemption. One more time. Redemption. One more time. One, two, three. Redemption. Redemption is the word over you. He is your redeemer and your maker is your husband. And I saw him just coming and, and wrapping you up in those words saying, I am, I am with you. I am for you. I'm redeeming. I'm redeeming everything that you've walked through. And that fire has only made you stronger. Yeah. In Jesus name. Amen. Awesome. Is that okay? Thanks guys. And then that couple here. Oh, here you guys are. Yeah, wow. Stand up, you guys. Holy smokes. The favor of God is undeniable. I don't have that, that much of a word, but I just wanted to say the favor of God on your life is absolutely undeniable. And I heard him say this. You ain't seen nothing yet. You, are, you have not seen anything yet. You're in a good house. There's something that you guys are getting here. There, you're getting developed and you're in process, but you guys are going to influence thousands of people. Like you are going, your, your, your uh, marriage, the family that you build, what you guys carry, the anointing on your life. I heard God say he's gonna open up doors over you. Fi finances are gonna follow you. There's provision on you. God's gonna like... The vision, young man, is the vision too big? Am I gonna do it? You wanna make sure it's all right, like, okay, we're planned out and we're good and we're able to do it. God's like, no, I'm gonna turn you upside down, boy, because I'm gonna back you and your vision needs to expand. She gets it. She's like, let's go. And you're like, hold on. You know, maybe you're risk averse and she's a risk that you've taken. And that's because the Lord has put you two together because you need her, you need that spunk in her and that courage in her because there's a lid he wants to screw off of you and there's something inside of you that's still, that's, that you don't even know is there. But I just affirm the man of God that you are and God's gonna, he's gonna grace you guys. He's given you favor. Dream big, like dream big. Take whatever you think is the best version of your life and, and double it. Like God wants you to dream bigger and, and put that thing, like, if, if you can attain it, young man, then it's your plan, not God's. Like, you got to get a plan that is like, if it's only God. I'm only going to get there if God takes me. That's where he wants you to go. He wants your plan to be out the window. He wants to be your plan A. And he wants your goals for your life to be like, this is impossible without the hand of God because the hand of God is going to be on your life. So favor, blessing, increase over you. I just Can we just pray? We just pray over him. God, I just pray that you would give him he would open his ears and just bring a season of hearing, hearing your voice, um, clarity. I pray for clarity and I pray for courage. I pray, Lord, that you would uncap that well of the dreamer that's inside of him and that you would help him take um, uncalculated risks for the kingdom and that you would show him the favor that's on his life and you would show him the plans and purposes that you have and that his horizon would begin to get expanded in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much. Is that okay? Is that okay? Awesome. Well, I can officially say I've been to Bucky's. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what's been going on with Texas. I've been to Texas. Texas loves Jesus, let me tell you. 
And, and being, I'm not an, a California native. I don't claim it. Okay, I'm not from there. Don't blame me. I know. There, I was telling them at lunch, we went to Cactus Jack's. It's amazing. I'm getting the full experience here. And a man opened the door for us as we were walking in and was so kind. It was a Jolene that he opened the door for Jolene. We all walked through. He was so kind and nice. I thought it was her husband. And I said, do you know this man? She's like, no, I don't know that man. I'm like, that's how rude California is. That's how foreign it was for me to see a stranger kindly open the door for someone and then talk to them. Because in California, they're just like, oh, well, whatever, you know, get out of my way. You're, you're not gluten-free. You're an idiot. Like, <laughs> it's like I couldn't believe. And I'm from the Midwest, so my roots are kindness, right? And county fairs and a casserole and a jello mold. Like, these are my roots. And I've been in California for so long, I'm afraid I'm getting rude. I couldn't believe it. And so, and so I've been to, te and it's, so it's good to be in Texas where people love Jesus because we're out in California just trying. And then people in California keep moving here. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> we're trying to keep them, but gas is two thirty-seven. Guys, we're paying six thirteen a gallon. Last time, I know. Last time we got gas, it was six thirteen a gallon. So anyway, <laughs> I've been to Texas a lot because you all have a lot of churches, and the youth in Texas love Jesus. And so I get I get to do a lot of youth events in Texas. Is this our youth? When people say that hope is dead or that the next generation doesn't know what, I'm like, hope is alive in America. And its name is Gen Z. And so I get to go to a lot of youth events, right, in Texas. And it's a youth event. So they're taking me to Whataburger because that's the budget. I, so this is my first time coming to the generous Mercy Gate Church. I'm having steak at Cactus Jack's. And then, so I've been to Texas, and no one has ever talked about Bucky's. I didn't even know. So I have this cute little gift bag in my hotel, and there's some beaver nuggets. And Jamie's like, right? She's like, oh my gosh, this is from Bucky's. I've never been. I've only heard. I've only seen it on TikTok. And I'm like, what's Bucky's? She goes, you don't know what Bucky's is? So she shows me a picture, and I go, oh, I've seen that. I thought that was an amusement park. <laughs> I legitimately, I thought it was like a giant Chuck E. Cheese. Like, I'm like, those giant buildings, that's a gas station? So I'm like, oh, you're so cute that you think that's a gas station. Clearly, it's too big to be a gas station. And, and Jolene took us this afternoon, and she goes, it's a gas station. Like, there's so many gas pumps. And then we went in, and I was, over, I was overcome with the glory of the beaver. It was... <laughs> It was the Shekinah glory. It took me. And I said, I have to use the bathroom. She's like, perfect. <laughs> oh, perfect. Bucky's bathrooms. Corey talked to me about Bucky's bathrooms for 30 minutes. That's, we didn't talk about revival in the church. We talked about revival in the Bucky's bathroom. He's like, Bree's like, I take my kids and I make them lick the ground because they can. That's where we go on road trips. I smear my baby. I take Callan and I wipe his bottom on the Bucky's bathroom floor. <laughs> Y'all love Bucky's. <laughs> it's good. So that's what California is missing. I'm um, like, we got the beaches, we've got the palm trees, we've got In N Out. But we don't have Bucky's. So I texted my senior pastor, Banny, and I said, Gas is 237. I'm moving. And he goes, You'd move for gas prices? I said, No, I'd move for Bucky's. <laughs> Oh, guys, can we talk about revival tonight? Revival, we're talking about revival a lot. The church has never talked about revival more than I think right now in this hour. We're singing songs on revival. We are having revival nights. We're having revival services. It's a massive topic right now in the church, and it can mean a lot of different things. But I don't like to say, God, send revival. Church, let's pray for revival, and then us not define what revival is. You know, so, and, and again, I, I was a youth pastor. Oh, I should say who I am, right? Oh, gosh, I just got, I got so caught up about Bucky's. I'm the executive pastor of Jesus Culture Sacramento. Um, my husband's our worship pastor. You could just do the org chart math in your head. It's fine. 
I'm the executive pastor. He's the worship pastor. It's fine. We don't ever argue about it. It's never caused any tension in the home. It's totally normal to be your husband's boss in a church. It's awesome. <laughs> and uh, we've got three kids. We love the church, and we... We are just, we're, we're believing for God to, to kiss California once again. And that's what, that's what we're living for. We're living to see revival in California and the nation. So uh, I was the youth pastor there for eight years. And two years ago, I stepped into the executive pastor role. Um, I've been with Jesus Culture for 15 years. And so um, that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, so revival. We talk about revival a lot at Jesus Culture. And, and, I, and, I, and I get the privilege of talking to the next generation. And, and you know, I think, I don't know, a couple years ago, just, don't you love teenagers? Oh, you love teenagers because they have no need to flatter you. Adults, you will flatter me tonight. You will laugh at jokes that aren't funny. You will amen me. You will help me along. These guys don't care. <laughs> they have no need to flatter. They have no need to. Lots of things on a teenager's mind. Making you feel good as a preacher is not one of those things on their mind, right? And I love them for it. And so I, I remember, I don't remember who it was, but some young person raised their hand and they're like, what even is revival? And I was like, what is revival? You're right. <laughs> they took us on this journey of really putting a definition behind it. So, so revival, it's the manifestation of God in our homes, families, and living rooms, but in cities, nations, and the world that leads to cultural transformation. So revival, it is an outpouring of the Spirit of God in our homes, right, in our cities and our families, but in the, and then in the, in the cities and in nations, and revival leads to cultural transformation. We have a longer definition of revival, but that's what we're talking about. When we say we want to see revival, we're saying we want to see an outpouring of God's Spirit in our homes, in our cities that leads to cultural transformation. And tonight, I, I want to talk a little bit about, well, what, where does revival come from? Where does it begin? What, or what's the main ingredient? Ingredient to see revival. And Pastor Don and I were talking on his podcast about that how America needs a great awakening. It's a revival. Yeah, the, a political party is not the answer. Revival is the answer. Like all this other stuff will help, but we need, aside from a, from a move of the Spirit of God, we're not going to see the transformation that we need to see take place. So it is important, church, that we understand what revival is so we understand what we're praying for. So revival, let's talk. But we're going to go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 3, we're going to read. Um, you're right. They did it. He told me they'd do it. I didn't believe it. And I said, I'm not going to say not to because I don't, I don't believe it unless I see it. That's amazing that we stand for the reading of the word of God. I love that. Um, I'm going to catch you up on your entire Bible plan for the year. And you're going to stand for a minute. And I'm not going to let you sit. Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height is 60 cubits and width was 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So... Da, 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 da. They all come together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and, and they stood before the image. Verse 4, a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and it goes through all these instruments. When you hear all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And so what happens is they, um, at that time, all the people hear the sound and they go and they, they bow down and they worship this gold image. Let's go over to verse 12. What happens is there are some, some Hebrews, some, some men who refuse to bow down to the statue and they're getting told on right here by the king's officials. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your God or worship the gold image you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and fury, gave the command to bring these men before the king. So he asked them, is this true? You don't fall down and worship the image which I have made? 
He says, if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered to the king, or Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you that we do not serve your gods, and we will not worship the gold image which you have set up. So they're sent to the fire. God saves them. It's, a, it's one of the coolest stories that I think is in the Old Testament. They're not harmed in any way. This, this figure appears, walks them through the fire, and they come out. And let's go to verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded your, their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I, this is Nebuchadnezzar, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made in ash heap because there is no God who can deliver like this. Amen. Amen. Sit down. You guys can be seated. You know that that's probably a very familiar story if you have a rich history with the Lord. You're like, wow, we bring her out from California, Jesus culture, and she reads us the chocolate bunny? The chocolate bunny story? I love revisiting these old stories, because what happens in church, I think especially those that are seasoned with the Lord, here's where we need to be very mindful. Don't become too familiar with stories that you miss the deeper revelation they carry. And this, I see this happen with Sunday school stories. I see this happen with Noah's Ark, with the parting of the Red Sea, with Daniel in the lion's den, with, with, with Joseph. They become, we become so familiar with them that we think we've, we've squeezed out all the revelation and insight that is arrogant and that is prideful to think that the word of God can't speak to you 60 years into your walk, that you could still be moved by the story of Noah's Ark. And so I love to revisit stories like this that are familiar because sometimes when we get so familiar, we reduce them down to something simple. This is not a Sunday school story. This is a full-on move of God revival that happens. This story is, is rich. It has, and it is, it is so, I mean, I'm like, guys, do we just, hold on. Nebuchadnezzar professes the power of the Hebrew God in Babylon. No cucumber and tomato can dance around <laughs> enough to convey the power of this story and what it means for the church today. This is a story of revival. An entire nation turns to God because of a yes in the hearts of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God always moves in revival through first the yes in the hearts of men and women. A yes in the hearts of his church always precedes revival. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. God is after our yes, church. I prophetically think that in this hour, what God is pursuing from his church is a yes. God longs to pour his spirit out. Scripture is clear on that. God longs to pour his spirit out. Revival is, is what God longs for. It's who he is. He's not, he's not withholding it until we do something. He's waiting for our yes. Revival happens first in a yes. You can't go through revival history and see a move of God apart from a yes. Just study revival history for any length of time and you will see that it always begins with a yes. There's a revival that happened, the, the great Welsh revival. We are still living in the fruit of the Welsh revival. You can read a book by Rick Joyner called The World of Flame about this. And the great Welsh revival started with a yes in the heart of a man named Evan Roberts. The Azusa Street Revival. You can read about which changed the course of the Pentecostal church. The Azusa Street Revival began with a yes. The Brownsville Revival in Florida happened when John Kilpatrick and a group of people said, yes, we will pray for a move of God to happen. And they had prayer meetings, just simple prayer meetings. They said yes first. When God wanted to meet with Nineveh, when God wanted to pour his spirit out on Nineveh, he wouldn't do it until he got Something from Jonah. A yes. 
I'm not going to preach Jonah because that would be all over the place, but I just want to, I want to make a quick detour. God is after our yes. God wants revival. We want revival. God says, great, give me a yes in your heart. So God pursues our yes. And what we see through the story of Jonah is God is relentless in his pursuit of our yes. He is relentless in pursuit of our yes. And let me tell you this, God has no problem making you uncomfortable to get it. God has no problem making us extremely uncomfortable to get our yes. This is what I think he's doing in the church right now. The church is a little bit uncomfortable right now. Because God is pursuing a yes. We're on the precipice, I think, of the next great awakening. I really do. I think we're on the precipice of the next Jesus people movement in the next generation. I think we are about to see one of the greatest revivals in history. We are on the cusp of that. That's what we prophetically believe. And we are in the belly of a whale. God puts Jonah in the belly of a fish just waiting to get that yes. That's how, it's how much God is in pursuit of it. He's like, you got to say yes. I need you to say yes. And I have no problem chasing you down. I do think some of you are in that season right now. I think some of you feel a little uncomfortable. I think some of you are in a bit of a wrestle right now in this hour. You know God has a, you know there's a call of God on your life. You know there's a call of God on your family. You know that you haven't yet experienced the promises that you've been waiting to experience. You know that there's more, but you are wrestling, and it's about your yes. I'm not speaking my sermon right now. I'm just saying, just, I'm just taking a detour to prophetically declare, if you feel uncomfortable in the season that you are in, God might just have you in the belly of a fish waiting for your wholehearted yes. Maybe God's not mad at you and punishing you. Maybe he's pursuing you. And you just haven't repented. You just haven't had a full turning away. You haven't had a full consecrated moment of saying, God, I will give you my all. Because the reality is, church, many times, oh, far too often, he's our, savior, he's our Savior, but he's not our Lord. All too often we see people who profess Jesus and he's the savior of your tomorrow so that you know where you're spending eternity, but he's not the Lord of your today. He's your savior, but he's not your Lord. There's a difference. He's your savior, but he's not the Lord of your fill in the blank. He's not the Lord of your family. And you are wrought with anxiety and dysfunction and unhealth and your, your house is a mess because you have not made him the Lord of your family, the Lord of your marriage, the Lord of your parenting. Your career, you're serving your career. Your career is your Lord and God is your savior. But he's also the Lord of your career. He's your savior but he's not the Lord of your finances. Because when the offering plate comes around, you clutch your wallet tight and start building your case on why the church misuses money and what, why you're exempt from the 10% tithe and why you don't have to live in generosity or give to advance the kingdom of God because someone else will do it. You want to say that's not true. The average, the stat is that 10 to 25% of the church tithe. We have 10 to 25% funding 100%. Can you imagine what the church in America would look like if we had 80% tithing? We wouldn't need foster care systems. We wouldn't need homeless shelters. We wouldn't, meet, we wouldn't need government handouts. That is our job, church. We're commanded in scripture to take care of the poor and the widow and the orphan. But we've got a church who hasn't made him the Lord of their finances. So you feel uncomfortable. And you're blaming spiritual warfare and you're anointing things and you're reading self-help books and you're, you're coming to the altar and I'm like, just say yes, you're in the belly of a fish, repent. God's after your yes, he's pursuing your yes. He's not punishing you, he's after you. He's not punishing you, he's pursuing you. And you know why he does it? Because he knows you won't be satisfied living below the call that he has. That's the only reason. Why is God after your yes? You're like, dude, you're Jonah. Send someone else. He's like, you won't be satisfied if I do. You won't be fulfilled until you're living the calling that I have for you. Of course he could send your neighbor. But they have a call different than yours. And so God will, will pursue 
and squeeze you and make you uncomfortable. You think the yes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're going we're gonna to get, you're like, aren't, aren't we reading Daniel? I didn't know we went to Jonah. You think the yes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was comfortable? Read the whole story. They weren't living a life of luxury. The yes wasn't easy. It led them to execution. So God is, he has totally okay making you quite uncomfortable. This is young adults, every young adult community. They're like, what is going on with my life? I'm like, you, you are going on with your life. I am so unnerved. I am so confused. I don't know what is going on. God, would you help me? And God's like, no, say yes to me. Let go of compromise. Stop sinning. Repent and turn away. I'm making you uncomfortable to get your yes because you won't be satisfied living below the prophetic destiny that I have for you. And so he'll pursue it. And if we're going to see revival in our homes, in our schools, in our campuses, in our workplaces, in our nation, if we're going to see a move of God, we have to understand this. He needs our yes. Texas needs your yes. There's still a lot of people who don't know Jesus in Texas. And oftentimes what happens is the yes starts years before the manifestation of God. The yes begins. Revival, yes, revival. You know, if, if we've got some people who are going to get technical on me, I'm going to say this statement. Revival doesn't just happen overnight. Well, yes, of course, God is sovereign and can do whatever he wants. But oftentimes, the yes that precedes revival happened years before, right? Evan Roberts, Welsh Revival, he's praying for years. John Kilpatrick, praying for years before God broke out the way that he did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said yes 29 years before they were thrown in the furnace and see God turn Babylon. 29 years. In 605 AD, they set themselves apart and refused to eat the king's royal food and wine. They wouldn't let themselves be defiled by Babylon for 29 years before their yes had the power to turn an evil ruler. They said yes for 29 years. In 576 AD, they go to the furnace and God's power turns a sinful nation. Sometimes revival takes Yes, for years. Your yes today might be for your children. Your yes today might be for your grandkids. Your yes today might be so that your great, great grandkids can experience a move of God. But here's the problem. We live in a culture that doesn't value the process. We live in a culture that doesn't want to wait. We have no value for things taking time. We hate, wait. you know, no one ever, you know what nobody ever is going to say in America? Do you know what I love? Waiting. I love when my flight's delayed. Best day ever. It took 40 minutes. What's hobby? What's the airport? What? Where are you flying me into? Hobby? What's hobby? It took 40 minutes to get my bags. They're, they get on the thing. I'm like, where's our, which, which carousel are we in? And we're just like walking around. I'm like, I don't know what carousel. You know, there's three carousels. We're flying from Sacramento from, to Phoenix. And, and she gets on. She goes, if you're just joining us and you're looking for your bags. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, it's driver's choice. I thought she was joking. <laughs> she goes, this isn't part of my sermon. There's no revelation here. This is a story. <laughs> she goes, it's driver's choice for where the Guy puts your bags. Is it always that way or is that just a prank? It's not. She literally, she gets, you guys are all confused. She literally goes, it's driver's choice. I'm like, what kind of freedom are they giving the airport workers? Just willy-nilly dropping it off. At, what if he puts her bag at one and my bag at two just because he's bored? Like, it was just funny. We waited 40 minutes for our bags. You know what I was in that 40 minutes? Irritated. I was irritated. No one's like, I love waiting because we have tried to structure an, an experience that is void of process. Give it to me now. Amazon turns into Amazon Prime. I did not think life could get any better. I'm like, I was born in the right generation. Amazon Prime. And now it's Prime now. You can get it in two hours. We want... 
When the internet, <laughs> you, you don't have, Prime, Prime now hasn't hit Texas? Woo. It's coming, it's coming. You might have Bucky's, but you don't have Prime now. California, we have Prime now. We can get you in two hours. Because we hate waiting. We will, we will, we will no longer patron a place because we waited. I won't fly your airline if I wait. I won't come back to this establishment if you make me wait. When the internet doesn't load fast enough, our life is over. And this is not just your generation. I think the older people are worse at this. We don't spoil them with our high, with our high speed internet, right? There is nobody that you will meet kinder than my husband. I'm telling you this. My husband, Derek, is one of the kindest men, right? He is, he is an angel. Like, he is so nice. He is patient. Everybody loves Derek. And they're like, with me, it's like, oh, once you get to know her, you like her. <laughs> I'm like, oh. once you get to know her, like, she, she grows on you. I'm like, what am I, like a fungus? I grow on you? Derek, you immediately love Derek. Like, if you saw, I'm like, Derek is like, he's just... Blonde hair, blue eyed, tall hands. They call him the human Ken doll. Like that is what I married. He's so kind. And he's so patient with our three kids. He has so much more patience than me. I'm painting the picture of Derek because that is the, that's not an exaggeration. You can ask Jamie. That's how Derek is. Except when our internet at home <laughs> goes down. When our internet at home starts to delay and it doesn't go very fast... I see a man I never knew existed. All of a sudden, he is like, he pulls up this fast.com. And he's like pulling down, how many MBPS are we pulling down? And he's on the phone with Comcast and Xfinity. He's like, you know what I'm paying for? According to my bill, I'm paying for a certain amount of megabytes per second. And I'm only pulling down half of that. I'm like, oh, all of a sudden, like Angel Derek loses his halo. And all of a sudden, he turn, I look over, he's got a sweatband around his head like Rambo and he's running through the house pulling wires up and resetting routers and he's, you know, cussing out the cable guy. No, he would never do that. Derek turns into a different man when the internet goes slow. We hate waiting. And the problem with that is God is all about the process. You know what God loves? Making you wait. You know what God values? Time, development, pruning, delay, testing, persevering. So when we live in a culture that despises waiting and tries to by bypass every process, but we serve a God who's pushing us into the process, we have to understand we have to be countercultural. We have to be countercultural. We have to understand my yes to revival today might not manifest for 15, 25, 35, 45 years, but I can't stop saying yes. I can't stop pursuing. I can't stop saying okay. I can't stop re re surrendering. So we say, here I am, God. Use me. Send revival. Break out. Yes, Lord, we come to Spiritual Emphasis Week. We get ignited. We come to conference. We get lit up. We go to camp. We go to YFN. And we're like, God's going to use me. I got a prophetic word. I'm at the altar. You're going to put your snot all over this altar in a couple minutes because we do a good altar ministry here at Mercy Gate. And then what happens? You say yes. You turn it all in. Yes, God, you can be the Lord of my finances. You can be the Lord of my family. Yes, God, we say yes. And then what happens? You're going to wake up in your bed tomorrow morning. You're going to go back to that job that's draining your soul. <laughs> You're going to go back to your life. <sighs> She's encouraging. <laughs> I told you Derek is the optimistic one. He's the likable one. What happens is we say yes. We say we want it. And then God puts you in a process. And God says, awesome, do you mean it? What happens is life doesn't look like we thought it would. That prophetic word's not really unfolding like I thought it was gonna. 
Life is harder than I thought it was going to be. This is taking longer. I thought you were going to break out in my family. God, you gave me a prophetic word that, that, that they were going to that they were going to turn, that things were going to, that provision was going to open up. God, you said you were going to turn this city around. God, you said you were going to bless this church. God, you said I was going to, God, you said. And then we get discouraged when we're in the process, right? Because we live in a culture that says it should happen now. It should happen prime now. And then we get discouraged. And then what happens is this is where we get complacent, mediocre, sleepy Christians going through the religious motions. I'm discouraged. Oh, yeah, God set me on fire when I was 18, 20. Oh, I was reading the word. I thought, I thought my life was going to look so much different. But now I just come to church on Sundays, except on the Super Bowl, because on the Super Bowl I skip church, and I tithe every now and then. And I don't know. I read my Bible when Pastor Don tells me to stand up. I hate that he tells me to stand up. I should go to a different church, but I'd have to drive 10 longer minutes. This one's closer. <laughs> And that's the church we're asking God to bring revival to? That's a half-hearted yes. You don't get to say a half-hearted yes to God's wholehearted yes to you. God gave you everything. He didn't withhold anything on the cross. He gave his son. He bled and died. He sacrificed it all. So in return, we say, you can have it all. You can have my everything. You can have all that I have to give. I think, I think everyone's done with sleepy church. And your yes has to be tested. It has to be refined. It has to be made strong. Listen, your yes can't turn a nation until it's been through the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their yes wasn't their yes until they walked through the fire. Before that, their yes was just words. God, we will say yes to you. We will not bow down. We will not compromise. God, you can have our all. But when it comes down to, hey, you're going to be thrown into a furnace, and then what God will save you now, that's when the yes gets real. And as they walked through the furnace, as they walked through the valley of the shadow of death, their yes gets power. Their yes can't turn Nebuchadnezzar to Yahweh because it's just words. Anybody can say yes, but I want you to show me yes. Show me yes. Show me that you're burning when no one else is burning. Show me that you're holding on to the promise 10 years after I gave it. Show me that you're falling in love with the word of God daily, even though you've been following him for decades. Show me that you're wholehearted, consecrated in worship, despite what you feel and how tired you are and what your emotions say. Show me that you're going to praise through the storm. Show me that your yes is your yes as you walk through the fire. And they get on the other side of the furnace and Nebuchadnezzar goes, no God can save like that. We are asking for God to turn a nation. We are asking for God to turn a state. We are asking for God to pour his spirit out individually and corporately. But our yes to that has to be tested. That's when it gets power. If, you, if you're married, you know this. Your yes isn't yes to your spouse at the altar. I do. Mm -hmm. We know why the guy, what the guy's thinking about. He's like, I do. Yes, I do. How long is this going to take? How long is the reception? Let's go. Come on. Move it along. And though, you know, the bride's like, I do. This is going to be amazing. I'm totally going to make him into the man I want him to be. I'm going to control every part of him. He's so much potential. This is like the best project ever. <laughs> I do. I do. I am going to change you. And he's like, and he's like, I do. I do. And I want to. And will we? And can we go, right? There's the yes. But the yes in marriage gets tested when the kids are sick. The yes in marriage gets tested when your spouse is going through a depression and can't get out of bed. The yes in marriage gets tested when you got no money in the bank and you're broke and you're not sure what's going to happen next. That's when your yes gets tested. If you're in a fire right now, if you feel like you're in a dry season, if you feel like you've been in a wilderness, 
I want to encourage you tonight. God hasn't left you. God's behind you, walking you through the furnace. God's, te- God's refining your yes. God's testing your resolve. God's giving you something that on the other side of this season will be powerful enough to make the enemy flee. Too often we get in the process. We've said yes. And from saying yes to experiencing revival, we die in the middle. Too often we walk away. We try another religion. We try another church. We leave our spouse. We fill in the blank. Keep walking. It's getting hot in here. You know what your city needs? A yes. You know what your kids need? You know what your kids who aren't following the Lord, you know what they need from you? Not a lecture on all the sin that they're doing and the mistakes that they've made and how disappointed you are. They need you saying yes in the fire. They need to watch you wholehearted consecration to God. They need to watch you making him the Lord and Savior over every single aspect. They need to see you not walking away. That's what your workplace needs. That's what your church needs. That's what your school needs. That's what your football team needs. That's what your friends need. And here's the thing. And we're wrapping. That's my first wrap. I'm going to do three. Three, we're wrapping. Here's the thing. It's costly. And this is what not enough people want to say. Not enough preachers want to say, this is going to be hard and this is going to cost you something. Because then you might not come back. And we feel way too good with the full room. So we just want to say what keeps you here. Not Pastor Don, obviously. It is costly. It is a, a yes to revival, a yes to the plans and purposes of God, a yes to the fulfillment of the destiny that's on your life is costly. We see this. I love this little line in, in the story. How many of you know that every word is telling us something in Scripture? There's no just superfluous detail. It's like, oh, that's not, no no, no need to pay attention to that. Every single word is God breathed in there for a reason. And so I love this little line. It tells you, you know, when you think about it, it's telling you, uh, verse three, it's saying, so the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image. Why is it, why couldn't God just say everyone? He's trying to tell us something. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's yes is costing them. Nobody else is doing what they're doing. Everybody who is anybody, it's listing government officials, it's listing influencers, it's famous people, it's wealthy people, it's nobody. Even other Hebrews are bowing down to compromise and to idols and they're living in Babylon and they're worshiping the false god. The yes that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said was costly and they were the minority. Church, we have to be on the fringes of culture. We have to be on the fringes of society. Where in the Bible does it say you should blend in? You should be undetected. You should go the way that culture is going. We have to know our family values must be different. Our sexual identity must be something. We should stand out. And we are compromising truth and we are watering down the gospel to keep people in the room. That is not a costly yes. That's an easy and cheap yes. And this story is telling us Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were, they were paying a price. It was a sacrifice. They were, the, were they the only ones? Were they really the only ones? Yes, that's the point of verse 3. They were the only ones. Young people, be the only one. Be the only one on your campus. Be the only one in your family. Be the only one of your friends. Am I really going to be the only one to save myself for marriage? Yes. Am I really going to be the only one who won't sexualize girls in the locker room? Yes. Am I really going to be the only one that won't send pictures on Snapchat? Yes. Be the only one. Let your yes be costly. Everybody. 
Everybody was bowing down. Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He does not pull any punches. If anyone loves the world, they don't love me. Drew a line in the sand. If you love the world, you don't have the, the love of the Father in you. Society is trying to tell us you can have revival and the world. You could have God's truth and you could have your truth. It's costly, but it's worth it. Because I don't want cheap Christianity. You guys know, we understand this in the natural. Anything of value is expensive, right? We know this. I, uh, I grew up in the Midwest. We had the Dollar General and Family Dollar. You have any of those? You have any of those? They don't even have them in California. That's how bougie. That's how rich and lost they are. They don't even have the, They have a 99 cent store that nobody really wants to talk about. But we had the family dollar and we had Dollar General. God bless the Dollar General. Everything I owned came from the Dollar General. And uh, <laughs> my mom, like, we bought everything off brand, right? Like, my Barbies were weird. They were like, <laughs> they didn't look right. And I didn't know it was Barbie because I thought it was Carby. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I'm like, my girlfriend's like, you know, they have like Barbie Barbie. And I'm like, this is Carby, and she has three eyes. <laughs> she drank weird water. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with her. She's a mutant, you know. <laughs> just cheap. Arms are always popping off. Cheap, just cheap dolls. We know that if something is valuable, it's going to cost me more money. So I grew up, we didn't have a lot of money from the Midwest. And now, ramen noodles, right, like are not that expensive. <laughs> what are they? What are they now? Like, I don't know. A buck and a half, right? Ramen noodles. And they weren't ever that expensive. And there, there is like top ramen. That'd be like, it's the top brand. It's like top ramen, right? I didn't even grow up eating the name brand ramen. I grew up, I'm, this, is a, this is a true story. I grew up eating this stuff called oodles of noodles. It was, do you know oodles of noodles? It was 19 cents a package, and it was called oodles of noodles. I knew nothing else existed. This was my ramen that I knew as a teenager. So I started dating the human Ken doll when I was 15. He, and Derek had, had, he had a little bit more money. His family had a little bit more money. And he was eating top ramen. Now I know oodles and noodles, okay? So we're on the phone one day. I'm 15, he's 17. And, and it's a, this was, so back in my day, you talked on that phone. That, that, you could call somebody and hear their voice. I'm just kidding. They're annoyed. Right? Don't ever invite her back, not to a youth event. Um, and so we're on the phone, and you know our teenage conversation, you know it sounds like, hi, what, what are you doing? Nothing, what are you doing? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> oh, wow, you sound so cute doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm walking. Wow, that's cool. Where are you walking? To the kitchen. I have a kitchen. <laughs> you know, that's our conversation. Four hours. Four hours of that. <laughs> it's no different now. 15 years of marriage, I'm like, bring toilet paper upstairs. <laughs> Just texting him. <laughs> it's real spicy. Remember, I'm his boss. <laughs> so anyway, we're on a conversation. I'm rapping. We're on a conversation, and I'm like, we're talking, and we're falling in love on, on these phone calls that lasted four hours long. And you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. So anyway, I'm making lunch one time on the phone with Derek, and he's like, what are you making? And I said, oodles, oodles of noodles. And he goes, why so many? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? And he's thinking, like, She's making a lot of noodles. Like, how many noodles? Oodles of noodles. Ah, I make oodles. <laughs> like, he's thinking, I'm telling him how many noodles. And also, I'm making a ridiculous amount of them. I'm making oodles of noodles. Ah, I'm hungry. <laughs> and so we have this miscommunication where he's like, why so many? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, what are you eating? And I'm like, oodles of noodles. And he's like, what is, what, a lot? I'm like, what? I'm like, you know, that package. And it's like a, a brick, and you microwave it with hot water and the seasoning. He's like, oh, are you, are you eating ramen noodles? I had no idea. I, had, I said, what are ramen noodles? He's like, you know, we have this whole conversation. And this is when I realized, oh, I've, I'm dating a bougie boy. 
okay. You pay 45 cents for Top Ramen. And we start talking about the difference in taste. And I'm like, you know, does it really taste different? I got oodles and noodles, 19 cents. Oodles and noodles, cheap. <laughs> Here's where this works. This works for youth conferences. I don't know if it's going to work for adults. <laughs> I don't want <laughs> oodles and noodles Christianity. I want that top ramen, top shelf, costly, expensive type of Christianity where I get to heaven. It worked. It worked. They flattered me. See? They were like, hmm. I want to get to heaven. And I want to be able to say, Jesus, it wasn't easy following you. There was so much sacrifice involved but may you receive the reward of your suffering because I gave you everything. I didn't withhold, but you can have it all. We sing it, we pray it, but we don't live it. If we are going to see revival, if we're going to see Texas turn, God wants a church that says yes that's living a costly, sacrificial walk with Jesus. Worship team can come on up. Keys, worship, whatever. If you guys want to go back into it, we're going to have a moment to just search ourselves and get before the Lord because it is a yes to a lot of things. It is a yes to humility. It is a yes to a life of prayer. It is a yes to living in community. I don't know where this ideology came in that it's just you and Jesus. That's some, the, that's some Instagram theology that doesn't hold up because it's not just you and Jesus. It's you in the midst of a community and accountability and people pouring into your life and people challenging you and people truth telling you and people calling you higher. So saying yes to God means I say yes to all of that. I say yes to a life of prayer. I say yes to a life of community. I say yes to scripture as the final authority. I refuse to let my experiences dictate my theology. And it doesn't matter if I haven't seen it. God's word said it. And that is what is true. It's yes to a life of scripture. It's yes to uncomfortability. And it is yes to holiness. Church, we have to refuse to eat the king's meat. We have to stop being defiled by Babylon all around us, telling us it's okay to compromise. It's okay to live with a little bit of addiction. It's okay to live with a marriage that's dysfunctional. Don't pursue health. Don't humble yourself and go get counseling and, and fix up your marriage. It's okay to live that way. These are the lies of culture. It's okay not to tithe. Someone else will do it. It's all right. You're exempt. It's okay to not believe that I will heal, save, and restore. It's okay to just bend your theology around your own pain and dysfunction so that you don't have to reconcile your experience with the truth of God. It's all right to be a little sleepy at church and sit down when your feet are tired. It's okay. Hey, worship isn't a commandment. It's a suggestion. You don't have to lift your hands. You don't have to sing out. Not true. Church, we need to say yes to living holy, which means we say yes to living set apart, which means we say yes to looking different, which means we say yes to being consecrated. And it's this yes. It is this wholehearted yes it is this sacrifice. It's the thing inside of us. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, we might go to the furnace. They said, listen, we might. We don't know if God's going to save us. We might go to the furnace. Even so, oh Babylon. Even so, oh culture. Even so, oh influencers. Even so, oh popular opinion. Even so, I will not bow down. I will not compromise. This is the kind of church he's asking Mercy Gate to be. This is the kind of church he's looking for in Texas. This is the kind of church we're called to be in America. This is the kind of church that will experience revival. Would you stand? I want to give us an opportunity here at the end of Spiritual Emphasis Week to repent. I want to give us an opportunity. And repent means it's more than I'm sorry. It's I won't go back. That word repent, it means turn, to turn away. 
I feel tonight that there are some things we have to turn away from. Tonight, let's turn away from the pride that holds us from living in community. Tonight, let's turn away from the fear that keeps us from living in generosity. Tonight, let's turn away from serving our own personal agenda, our own ideals and what we think our life should look like. And let's give him a wholehearted, consecrated yes. You can have it all. You guys have a song where we could sing that? Something like, you can have it all. Give me Jesus, something like that. I want to invite you forward if, I want to do two different things. Because in moments like this, and I've, and, I've, and I've been, listen, I've been guilty of it. You give an altar call and you're just like, anyone come forward. Because it feels good to respond and it's like, awesome, okay, it did something. But I want to stay faithful to this. I want to call those who know this is for me. And Jesus says, nobody, or Paul says, nobody, no builder begins a project without first counting the cost. Nobody starts a project without, because then they'd be embarrassed. I don't have what I did. I don't have what it takes to finish this project. And I started something I can't finish. So I want you right now. I want you to take inventory of your life. And I want you to count the cost. Saying yes means something's going to change. Saying yes means I'm going to have to give something up. I'm going to count the cost of this response. I'm going to count the cost of coming forward to the altar. You guys could close your eyes. And there's just an invitation. You can say yes in your car on the way home. You could say yes when you get home. You could say yes tomorrow. You could say yes next Sunday. But there is something about these invitations. There is something about being together corporately where the Spirit of God has come and we have come here for a, for a specific reason. And I just say that to give some, I, I feel like I'm, I don't normally explain it this much. I'm like trying to explain why a joke is funny. There is something, but there's a grace available right now to walk away from some things. There is a grace available. There are some things you can only get corporately, church. Some things you can only get corporately. And there is a grace available right now for a response. If there's something in your life that you need to turn away from, I want to I want to invite you forward. Why come to the altar? Physical obedience can bring about spiritual breakthrough. It is just a symbolic act because it is more comfortable to stay in your seat. And there are some of you that you're just burning, your heart burns within you. You know, I'm speaking to you. You're like, I know she's talking to me. And you're like putting a fleece out. She says it one more time, I'll come. All right, one more time, I'll come. You know that you need to get uncomfortable. I've been living too comfortable. I haven't been challenged in my walk. My yes isn't, it's, it's just a yes right now, but I haven't, I'm not putting it through the fire. And, and it feels like walking down the aisle and walking up is actually, it'd be like walking through a furnace for you. I want you to come up. I want you to walk through that heat. I want you to walk through that whatever, what, what the expectation that you might feel or, or what, whatever it might be. If it feels embarrassing, maybe it feels new. I've never done that. I've never responded. I want you to come up. I want you to fill this space. Keep coming. Nobody in the aisles. Keep coming. Make room for them and keep coming. There's not more spirit of God up here, but there is a, a reward to physically stepping outside of your comfort zone to attain the spiritual breakthrough that he has for you. Just keep coming. I know there's more of you. There's someone here tonight and you're, you're struggling with addiction. I don't know if it's to uh, something, a, a website, something a virtual, if it's substance, but I want you to come forward because God wants to heal you tonight. I saw, I saw God bring, I got, sorry, Jesus, God. I saw God coming with them. I don't even know what they are, those big tools that cut chains. And I saw him, and there was addiction. You were wearing addiction like a chain. You were wearing it like a necklace, and it's become a part of your, it's become a part of your outfit. You're like, I don't, this is just what I wear. And I saw God coming with big wire cutters, and he was cutting that chain of addiction off of your neck. If that's you, and you can feel that heaviness on you, feel that heaviness on your neck, 
I want you to come forward if you're not already up here. And I just want you to receive. I want you to receive freedom from that. You are not called to live in bondage. You are not called to live in addiction. If you're up here, I want you to just begin to cry out. If there's prayer, prayer team can come sometimes. If you could just maybe pray, um, pray quietly behind people and just lay your hands on them. If there's, if there's a prayer team and you've been given permission in this house to pray, we can begin to lay our hands on people. If you're up here, if you're in your seats, I, I really do want to invite you, just keep your eyes closed and stay in this moment. There's a response happening. If you're up here, I just want you to begin to, to cry out to God in your own way and say, God, it's time for me to say yes. It's time for me to turn away from, and then whatever it is, it's time for me to turn away from people's expectations. It's time for me to turn away from serving fear. Some of you, if you're, you're serving fear and anxiety, all of your decisions are made by the fear and anxiety that you wake up with. There is freedom from you in this house from fear and anxiety that's been dictating and ruling your, your decisions. Can I ask you, I just, I wanna know if that's you, if that resonates, could you raise your hand? Fear and anxiety. Yeah, I felt like it was heavy with the women. That fear and anxiety is, that's what's been keeping you from a yes. God's even been asking you to do some things, but it, the fear and the worry of how it might turn out has actually kept you from full obedience. There's freedom. I just see God all over you, sis, right there in the blue Nike. You're raising your hand. God is just all over you. Just, just stay in that moment. Just lift your hands to him. There's freedom for you. Holy Spirit, I just pray. Just close your eyes so, and receive I just saw Holy Spirit come in like a rushing water and he was just breaking down barriers. I saw like the dam busting loose in your life and he was coming and he was just, he was watering the dry places. He's, I just see that for you guys. He's watering the areas that haven't received any water. Holy Spirit hasn't been able to touch those areas because it's been so blocked up. There's been uh, just obstacles built from, from trauma and from disappointment and from pain. Holy Spirit, now we pray that you would come and you would come like a rushing water through our lives and that you would break down every structure that, that we've built, every structure that man has placed, every structure that the enemy has built in our lives that has kept us from the full experience of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would come right now. That you would come right now. The Spirit of God is on you, man. The Spirit of God is on you. You're a preacher. You're a preacher like a fire shut up in your bones. There's a word there's a word in you, a father to many. Yeah, God wants to change the, the, the inheritance and what your, what your father passed down to you. There's something different that you are going to pass down. He's just breaking generational, just breaking generational uh, curses and, and bondage over your life. Whoa, yeah, you're going to walk in freedom. You're gonna, and you're gonna set young men free. I see you ministering to prisoners. I see you ministering to juveniles. I see you ministering to, to troubled young men. And I saw you bringing freedom to them. Yes, Lord, more. Fire of God, come. Fire of God, come on this man.
there anyone struggling in the, in the room? Are there any couples dealing with infertility? Struggling to get pregnant? One here. Are there any others? Can you help me see if it, here too? Are these two? Is that the only two? I saw the Lord healing wounds tonight. And so can we pray for you? If there's people around them, could you do me a favor? Could you put your hand on them? If there's people around them, let's put your hand on them. Ladies, if you could put your hand on your, on your stomach. Yeah, God, I pray that you would heal their bodies, that you would bring breakthrough, that this season of, of barrenness would come to an end. And like you remembered Hannah, you would remember these women. God, I pray that you would heal them from the season of disappointment, from the season of delay, from, from all the doubt that they've wrestled with after not seeing the fulfillment of their desire. And God, we pray that you would open their wombs, that you would open and heal their bodies, that they could bear children, that this dry and, and scary season would end and you would bring them into a fruitful season. You would heal their bodies, God, I pray. I pray for breakthrough over these women. I pray for breakthrough. I pray for healing. I pray for hope restored. And God, we thank you. We thank you for the children that will come from this house. We thank you for the babies that will be born in these families. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. I want to end, but I just don't feel like we're supposed to. I think there's still more yes to give tonight. And so I just want to give another invitation. There's so, there's God's encountering beautifully up here. It's just stay in that moment, stay in that space. Worship team, can you guys keep going for a bit? And I just want to give another, another invitation for anyone who'd want to come forward and say tonight, there's areas of my life that I have not surrendered. Maybe you're Jonah and the whale, <laughs> but you know there's areas that, I, that you could look and there's certain yeses, but there's a bunch that you've not said yes to yet. And I just want to invite you forward to have a moment with Holy Spirit, to have a moment of surrender, that he would speak to you, that he would challenge you tonight, and that there would be grace up here at this altar to go all in. There would be grace to say yes with everything we are. There would be grace to be a people who don't withhold anything, who don't compromise, who don't bow down, who say, yes, you can have it all. Whatever you would ask, Jesus, whatever you would require of me. If you want me to wake up early and pray, I'll do it. If you want me to come to midweek services, I'll do it. If you want me to serve on the team, I'll do it. If you want me to witness to my coworkers, I'll do it. If you want me to give more of my money, I'll do it. If you want me to support missionaries, I'll do it. If you want me to lay down this substance, I'll do it. If you want me to go to marriage counseling, I will do it. If you want me to change the way I'm parenting, I'll do it. God, there is nothing that you could search in my life that you would find a no to, but you can have it all. If you don't have that yes, if you don't have that wholehearted, head to toe, full consecration to the Lord, but you want it, come forward. We're saying yes tonight. We're saying yes tonight. We are surrendering because we know God. It's the yes that brings revival. It's the yes that brings your spirit. We know, God, it's the yes that can turn a kingdom. It's the yes that will bring out your spirit in our homes, in our families, in our churches, in our cities. And that's what we're here for. You can have it all. And we're just going to keep worshiping. Put it on your lips. You're more than every drink if you don't know what to pray, sing these words. All of the things I thought I wanted don't come close to If you don't
don't believe them, still sing them. Something will begin to shift in your spirit. If you don't know that there are, if there are things that you want more than Jesus, just begin to sing this song and let those things lose their grip on you. Come on, you cry that out to the Lord.
God wants to hear your heart. Father, I pray tonight that as we sing this declaration put to a melody, God, that it become, God, a truth that we live by, that you are our one thing. God, that we put you first and foremost above everything else and anything else. God has just simply hear an echoing theme because to be able to do that, we have to be bold, we have to be courageous. And so, Father, tonight I pray, God, that boldness only comes, courage only comes when we step up into the face of fear, resistance, and adversity. And so, God, I pray, Lord, as those opportunities come, that courage would rise up within us. God, that boldness would stand up strong within us, oh Lord. God, that each and every day, each and every moment of the day, multiple times during a day, we would just reaffirm our yes to you, but also to ourselves, God. Father, we thank you for the word that we've heard tonight, God. And Lord, I pray that it find a deep place in our heart that we can live it out. We can walk it out. We can continually, Lord, give you our yes. Our yes. When we fail, God, let us get up again real quick. Father, I pray your blessing, God, upon this week, upon every word that's been shared, that's been prophesied, that's been decreed and declared. God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would seal every promise. Seal every word of it, oh God. Lord, that it will give not just fruit, but much fruit, and much fruit will remain. And Father, we will see the evidence of it in the years to come. That in 2024, we went on an adventure with God. And that adventure never stopped. God, we bless you, we love you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen.